Good evening, everyone. It's a blessing to be with you here, and I appreciate the effort all of you took to come out this evening and join us for our conversation on religious extremism. Thank you for being here. Radical Islamic terrorism. Radical Islamic extremism. We are familiar with these terms. They become part of our public discourse. But I think especially in our time and place, there are two things about religious extremism that are important for us to know. We must know that religious extremism is not just a problem with Islam. And I think it's also important for us to know that extremism is not just a problem with religion. Religious extremism is not just a problem with Islam. Extremism is not just a problem with religion. Before I focus in on these two points, though, I want to spend some time explaining to you how I understand the terms extremism and religious extremism. Extremism is not an easy thing to define. It's really a matter of perspective. You may be familiar with the expression, one man's terrorist or one man's extremist is another man's freedom fighter. It depends on your point of view. We also tend to use the word to cover a wide array of perspectives and behaviors. But with that in mind, I offer the following definition. Extremism is a range of perspectives and behaviors. Extremism, as I said, can take various forms. And I think there are different levels or gradations of extremism. Extremism is a range of perspectives and behaviors advocating for social, political, or economic change. There's a sense among extremist groups that there's something wrong with the current social order that needs to be changed, that needs to be transformed. Extremism is a range of perspectives and behaviors advocating for social, political, or economic change, which the majority in a given society regard as unreasonable, unjustifiable, and even criminal. At some point, the antipathy or violence expressed by such groups reaches a level at which many or most in society judge to be extreme. They judge the perspectives and the behaviors to be unreasonable, unjustifiable, or even criminal. Religious extremism, then, is the intermixing of religious ideology with extremist perceptions and behaviors. It occurs when extremists draw from their religion to shape their understanding of the current situation and what's wrong and what needs to be done about it. They draw from religious ideology to justify their actions, oftentimes claiming a divine mandate for what it is that they do. And they draw from religious narratives and religious symbols to promote their agenda to those who might be receptive to their perspectives. Now allow me to return to my first point. Religious extremism is not just a problem with Islam. Many of the most destructive and well-known terrorist attacks of the last two decades have been committed by individuals and groups claiming an association with Islam. In light of this, it is understandable that we would draw a connection between extremist activities and this religious tradition. It's understandable that we would use terms like radical Islamic extremism and radical Islamic terrorism to refer to these groups and their activities. However, our readiness to use the terms terrorist and radical extremism in connection to Islam is often coupled with a tendency to use those terms almost exclusively in relationship to Islam. This practice reflects and reinforces a deficient understanding of religious extremism, the tendency to see it as primarily a problem with Islam. It's crucial for us to understand that every major religious tradition contains an extraordinary degree of internal diversity. We use the terms Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and so on, and we assume that these terms identify traditions that are homogeneous and consistent systems of stable beliefs and practices. But they are not. Within each of these traditions, not only theological factors, but historical, cultural, social, political, economic factors have and continue to lead to a multiplicity of groupings with varying beliefs and practices. And then within each of those groups, things like race, gender, sexuality, 
socioeconomic status, life experience, and personality have led to varying beliefs and perspectives among their members. Scholars of religion call this intersectionality. Now I know this may seem like a complicated and especially erudite term, and scholars of religion are happy for you to think so. It makes us feel important. <laughs> but this is really a pretty basic concept. It is simply the reality that a person's religious practice intersects with and is thus shaped by a host of variables that also impact that person's sense of identity and worldview. The result is that each and every religious tradition is characterized by and complicated by a dizzying array of diverse practices and beliefs. It is also the reason why most religious traditions contain pockets of religious extremism. Incidents of Islamic extremism, as I mentioned above, may capture the greatest share of our attention. But there are Christians, Jews, Buddhists, Sikhs, Hindus, among many others, who have reached the highest levels of the extremist scale. Allow me just to share a few examples. On February 25, 1994, American-Israeli Baruch Goldstein massacred Palestinian worshippers at the Ibrahimi Mosque in Hebron, West Bank. The attack left 29 people dead and 125 wounded. Goldstein was a member of the Jewish Defense League, an American terrorist organization founded in 1968 and still active today. More recently, manifestations of Jewish extremism have been occurring in Israel and Palestine with increasing frequency. In the past three years, a dozen mosques, churches, and monasteries have been bombed, burned, or vandalized. Numerous attacks against Palestinians have been reported. In July 2016, an arson attack in a Palestinian village killed a toddler and his parents. After this, the New York Times reported on a video that shows Israeli guests at a wedding dancing with knives and stabbing the picture of the child that had been killed. In Buddhism, in Myanmar in particular, or Burma, radical forms of Buddhism have led to repeated attacks on Muslims and other minorities. In 2012, over 200 Muslims were killed and thousands of their homes burned by Buddhist nationalist extremists. In 2014, 48 Muslims, mostly women and children, were killed in another massacre. Over 100,000 Muslims and other minorities have been forcibly displaced into militarized camps. Much of the violence has been spearheaded by the Buddhist monk Ashen Warathu, who once referred to himself as the Burmese bin Laden. Within just American Christianity, we have the Ku Klux Klan whose members lynched 4,000 African Americans from 1877 to 1950. We have militant anti-abortion groups tied to dozens of attacks on abortion providers, including several murders. We have numerous right-wing militias claiming an association with Christianity who have planned to or carried out several attacks on American soil. In 2010, nine members of the Christian militia Huttery were charged with plotting to kill a police officer and slaughtering scores more with homemade bombs. In 2014, Larry McWilliams, a member of the Phineas Priesthood, went on a shooting rampage in Austin, Texas, <coughs> firing 100 rounds at various buildings, including a police station, the Mexican Consulate Building, and the Federal Courthouse, before he himself was shot by police. And then there's the neo-pagan Anders Bering Breivik, who committed two deadly attacks in Norway in 2011. He killed eight people by detonating a van bomb in Oslo and then shot dead 69 participants of a summer camp on the island of Otoya. Islam does not have the corner market on extremism. We may be inclined to think so because of the way we label extremist acts and the reality of living in a post 9-11 world. But the data simply does not support this perspective, especially if we zero in on terrorism right here in America. Back in 2009, the Department of Homeland Security issued a warning that right-wing militia-type groups were a growing threat here in the United States. It stated, quote, lone wolves and small terrorist cells embracing violent right-wing extremist ideology are the most dangerous domestic terrorism threat in the United States. 
Similarly, a 2015 report released by Duke University's Triangle Center on Terrorism and Homeland Security finds that law enforcement agencies in the United States consider anti-government violent extremists, not radicalized Muslims, to be the most severe threat of political violence they face. Another report published by the National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism and Responses to Terrorism, I'm sorry, these reports have very long names. <laughs> you probably tell this is a government publication. So the National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism and Responses to Terrorism reported the following breakdown for religious groups committing terrorist attacks between 1970 and 2011. 33 percent of those groups were Christian, 30 percent were Jewish, and 22 percent were Muslim. Religious extremism is not just a problem with Islam. Second point, extremism is not just a problem with religion. I mentioned before the reality of intersectionality when it comes to religious observance. Namely, that one's religious observance intersects with all sorts of variables that influence one's sense of identity and worldview. In North America, one of our cultural proverbs is, religion and politics don't mix. But for the vast majority of humans throughout history, and I think for the vast majority of humans still today, religion does mix with politics, economics, social location, culture, along with a host of factors impacting communities and individuals. It is almost never just about religion. And yet there is evidence to suggest that when it comes to extremism, what we would commonly identify as strictly religious factors may be the least significant of all. There is still much uncertainty on the causes of extremism and terror, but according to several recent studies focusing on former and current terrorists, those joining such groups and committing such acts frequently share three characteristics. They frequently share a sense of a threat to their well-being, the sense that they are not safe, that someone is threatening to do them harm. They share a perceived sense of socioeconomic exploitation or deprivation. They believe that they and their families do not have enough resources they need to live well, and that someone is actively keeping those resources from them. They also share a perceived sense of the dissolution of their cultural values, that their way of life is being threatened, that society as they know it or society as they want it to be is crumbling around them. In our own day, there are numerous instances of extremist attacks that do not appear to be directly tied to a religious perspective, but instead seem to be motivated primarily by these fears. And some of these extremist acts have been among the most violent. Timothy McVeigh bombed a federal building in Oklahoma City in 1995, killing 168 people and injuring over 600. In a letter written after the attack, he justified it as a response to an increasingly militarized government that was threatening its citizens. Wade Michael Page attacked the Sikh temple in Oak Creek, Wisconsin in 2012, killing six worshipers and wounding three. A neo-Nazi white supremacist, Page sported a tattoo referring to the 14 words, shorthand for the white supremacist catchphrase, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. Dylan Roof entered a Charleston church and killed nine African-American participants in a Bible study in 2015. Roof was raised a Christian but in his handwritten manifesto, he cited his fear of widespread black aggression against whites as the reason for his attacks. And on January 29th of this year, Alexandre Bissonnette, a far-right nationalist who opposed any form of multiculturalism polluting his society, killed six worshipers and injured numerous others in a Quebec mosque. To further underscore this point, I will cite again from the report published by the National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism and Responses to Terrorism. It reported the following breakdown for groups committing terrorist attacks between 1970 and 2011. Of the groups that committed these terrorist acts, 
32% were identified by the study as ethno-nationalist separatist extremists. 28% were identified as single issues extremists. These would be groups that are protesting um, damage to the environment or things like abortion. 23% were identified as left-wing extremists. And 11% were identified as right-wing extremists. The consequence of that is that 94% of the groups that it identified as committing terrorist attacks, it identified as being non-religious groups. The remaining 6% were religious groups. And I'm going to qualify this just a bit. Of those 94%, 24% were identified by the study as having a re religious sub-ideology. But even if you add in those groups, we're seeing about a quarter of the groups are identified as having a primary or secondary religious motivation for performing terrorist attacks over those last 40 years. In short, extremism is not simply or even primarily a religious problem. Extremism is also, and perhaps even more so, an economic, a political, a social, and a psychological problem. So what might we do with this information? What might be an appropriate way to respond? I think in general it's very important for us to be careful about the language we use to describe acts of religious extremism and to ask that other people do the same. This is important to, to avoid misperceptions about Islam and the character of religious extremism in general. More specifically, I think we should be using consistent terminology to refer to extremist actions and attitudes across ideological lines. If we are going to continue to persist using phrases like radical Islamic terrorism, radical Islamic extremism, then I think we need to be prepared to use phrases like radical Christian terrorism, radical Jewish extremism, radical Buddhist terrorism. But I think perhaps even more importantly, we should err on the side of generosity and respect when identifying extremists with particular religious traditions. Invoking the golden rule, I think we should talk about religious traditions in the same way we would like others to talk about our own ideological perspectives. I think that means that we have to figure out ways of referring to religious extremists without implicating a religious tradition as a whole. Thank you.